today, Amy and I would like to um, give you a little introduction to the first phase of our lessons in our book, God's Great Grand Expedition, The Great Commission. And um, I wanted to give a little bit of instruction um, for those of you who are going to be making disciples of people that you're not quite sure that they've been saved or um, have any background of knowledge, biblical knowledge. So this is just a little um, intro to how to use this book before we talk about the gospel um, proclamation. So the first thing that you would want to do is, um, as a leader, you would want to study the book, the two lessons on um, the Great Commission and the Five Levels of Spiritual Growth, because this is our strategy that we follow. This is what we do. We're making disciples of all nations, and we are um, the Five Levels of Spiritual Growth is how we have divided our lessons into phases. Um, phase one is the gospel, and that's what we're going to be um, talking about today here in a minute. And then the next thing that you would need to do to start this process is to find you a person who... Um, who will meet with you to study God's Word. So if this person has never, again, um, heard the Gospel, or you're not certain if they're a Christian or have a biblical knowledge, I would start right with the Gospel lessons. And um, you may be wondering, how do I find someone to disciple? And basically, we say that we start in the church. We always start, um, you know, with those closest to us because... Not every person in the church has heard the gospel, a true gospel. Not everyone who goes to church is saved. And, um, and then it may be someone that you meet. Um, like Amy and I just met a young woman from China at a restaurant, and we've started the process with her. So you would want to start um, by getting to know the person. That's where it begins, your first meeting. You would want to get, get to know them. You would want to give them... Um, the booklet or at least a copy of our spiritual growth survey that's in the back of the book. This is just a, a tool for you to kind of get to know them. Just ask them their story. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your your life story so that you get to know them because this is discipleship is two things. It's life and truth. So it's a relationship. And so we want to build a relationship by getting to know one another every time we meet. So that would be the very first place, the first meeting. And then the next meeting, you would discuss a spiritual growth survey. Just go through the questions. Um, and that, again, will kind of help you to gauge where, where you're at and, and share life with one another that way. And then um, you want to study the lessons prior to teaching them. You want to study them. Um, just You only need to be one lesson ahead of the people that you're going to be discipling. You don't have to have all the, the lessons memorized. That's not necessary. But you want to be able to study and be prepared um, to meet. And, of course, you want to pray. And, um, and then the digging deeper questions. In every lesson, there's an abundance of Scripture. There's almost a scripture for every point, and that's not necessary that you read all of those or share all of them. It's just there as another tool. So if you want to go deeper, you can. If you want to stay with the main scripture, you can. So that's just a little introduction to how to use the book. And then you, it's it's pretty self-explanatory. Hopefully, it's. do you think it's user-friendly? Yes. Amy? Okay. Um and it's and it's easy to make your own too. So yes. you don't have to you don't have to follow like every single phrase that Miss Jenny has. Just get the main points and make it personal too. Yeah. And so you use your own example. You can use the examples that are in the book, or you can use your own examples, and you can make your own outline if you'd like um, for your disciple. But it's 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 a tool. That's what this book is is a tool. So what I want to talk about now for the next few minutes is just the introduction. This would be the, the first lesson that you would do um, as you're going through the process before you start the actual phase one gospel lessons. This would be lesson number one. And I want to read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Paul says, Now I want to make clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, that you received and on which you stand, and by which you have been saved, 
if you hold firmly to the message that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as of first importance what was also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. Um, in this passage, Paul kind of breaks it down. He says very clearly that he proclaimed what was passed on to him, and that's the whole process of disciple-making. What we learn, we're going to give to other people. That's the, that's the plan. <laughs> that's the multiplication of it. Everything that God's Word was given to us, that we could hear it, learn it, study it, and give it away to others. So that's what Paul said exactly what he did. What I heard, what I received... He had to be teachable, and we know that Paul was a learned man, but he was teachable. He received it from all the eyewitnesses, all the disciples, after he met the Lord on the road to Emmaus. And then, uh, no, was it Emmaus? No. No, it the was. road to D Damascus. Damascus, thank you. Okay, I'm getting them mixed up. So anyway, this is what he, um, what he received, he gave to them. This is the gospel. And so he, he breaks that down for us exactly what the gospel is. He said, um, the first importance, number one, what I received was the gospel. And that's why, again, in this process, we always start with the gospel. Why do we start with the gospel if we're discipling someone who's been in church for many years and has already received the gospel? Because every lost person needs to hear the gospel to be saved. Every saved person needs to have a tool to be able to share the gospel with others. So the gospel is for all of us, and it's for all of our lives. It's not just for, for salvation, but, um, but it is for salvation. So Paul says that I passed on to you what is most important, what I first received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So my pastor on Sunday broke this, broke down the, what the gospel is. Um, God first, it's, it, the gospel begins with God. Then that he died for our sins. And, and so man, man are sinful. We have a problem. God has a solution. Christ um, provided that solution when he died on the cross for our sins that he was buried, and that he was resurrected on the third day. And all of this, when Paul is saying, when we're, we're talking about the, the, the scriptures, according to the scriptures in the Old, New Testament, it's always referring to Old Testament passages. So again, we, we are learning together the importance of rightly dividing God's word, cutting it down the middle, learning to, when it's, when it's referring to scriptures, right, like in this case right here, we know that Jonah is one example of, of Christ being buried and resurrected. He was three days in the belly of the well, and he was raised up. Um, also, Psalms 22. Psalms, um, well, it's, it's leaving me right now. But anyway, the, the Old Testament passages, we're going to look at in a second. We're going to look at the gospel beginning in, in Genesis quickly. We're going to go through an acronym that paints a picture of the whole gospel message in the Bible. But... So, the first thing that I want us to look at, Amy, if you would look up for me, um, Romans 1.16, and Romans 1.16, okay. Okay, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Okay, thank you. So, um, the main goals for this first phase of lessons, this is the introduction to them, is to, number one, to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Number two, to gain assurance that we have been saved. Number three, to equip believers with the message of the gospel. So, the greatest story ever told is, is contained within the Bible. Um, this is the gospel. So when we think of the Bible, we think about a collection of stories compartmentalized into individual books, which in fact, um, when in fact it's really just one long story. It's the greatest story ever told. In the story, there's one hero of the Bible. It is Jesus Christ. There's one theme of the Bible. Um, 
and that's Jesus Christ and the whole the entire book is is pointing us to him and um, it explains the root of our problems and explains the cure for our problems and it is a history book um, Amy and I were sharing with our, our new um, friend and I believe very soon to be sister in Christ from China that that it really is a history book we learn history we learn geography we learn uh, science it's it's all there it's a history book and the history is all about him and so um, we become students of God's Word. but So here's an acronym, uh, a simple acronym that Betsy Kellen from Downline Ministries taught us, and we learned this also as I went through Downline. But it's an acronym that encapsulates the Bible narrative. And um, so this could be shortened into a, sh a few short sentences, or you could expound on this greatly. Um, this is my adaptation of what Betsy taught me um, in a short conversation. So we start with the first word is A, uh, letter is A for anticipation. So the word Genesis means beginning, and in the beginning of time and space and of all creation was recorded in God's big storybook called the Bible. The first book is Genesis, and it's the beginning of time. So this is the beginning of time, whereas God was outside of time. There is eternity past and there is eternity future, but what is contained in the Bible is um, history of time, um, time and space. So um, the beginning is one of one of God's self titles is is the beginning. So um, Jesus said in Genesis one one and two. You want to read that? Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, and it was void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So, right there, we see that, that first Hebrew word um, translated as beginning, is, which means Genesis, um, is plural in Hebrew they don't they're not going to change a jot or tittle they don't understand it but they will not change it because that that's again would be breaking the law to change God's word but it's plural so the the word beginning is plural so who was in who was the beginning who is beginning God who created verb singular created it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit right there in the first two verses of the Bible. So we were already pointing, it's already pointing us to the one who wrote in the last book of the Bible in Revelation 1.8. He said, I am the beginning and I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. So we see that from the very first of the Bible, there is someone who is anticipated. There's someone that the the lights are um, shining on, but he's hidden in symbols and and shadows that are not revealed until um, until he came, until his incarnation. So from the Alpha to Omega, which is the two Greek the Greek letters of the alphabet. Um, from A to Z, from cover to cover, and everything in between, there is one hero of the Bible. The mystery of who the Creator was is explained in 1 John, excuse me, John 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created by Him. Um, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, and um, John 1 all tell us that this beginning God was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, in fact, Creator God, and He is beginning God who created all things. So, in the beginning, God made a, a good and perfect place called the Garden of Eden. And um, it all starts there. Even our faith begins. The, the genesis of our faith begins by believing in, in the Bible, number one, that this is not just a book. This is, in fact, the very Word of God. And the beginning of the, the, the account, the written account of creation in the Bible. And that's from Hebrews 11. 
But in the beginning, God made a perfect place called the Garden of Eden. And when everything was ready to sustain their lives, God made Adam and Eve the first, um, the first people to be created. Um, God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. He formed Eve out of the rib of Adam. Um, and he created them, when it says he created them in his own image, it says they, it says it means that he was, they were created in his shadow, to shadow or shade. So um, they were the crown jewels of all his creation. And it's interesting to note that that word, again, means shadow and shade because he made them to be in a close, intimate relationship with him, with the creator. And that's, that was his plan from the very beginning, is that he would walk and live with his people in a perfect place. And that's how the story ends also. But um, so they were, they were his disciples. Adam and Eve were God's disciples. He inaugurated the first family um, when he offici officiated the wedding. So the family is the first um, institution that God established. And, and everything else in society flows out of that. That explains a lot of our problems today because of the breakdown of the family. So it was a paradise there because God was with them in the garden. Um, for their own good, God gave them only two rules. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was everything was good and right and perfect. And then Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they, they broke the one rule. From that moment on, everything suddenly changed from very good to horribly bad. And the two had to leave the presence of God in the paradise. It seemed like everything would be lost, but God had a plan that one day he would make a way for them to come back to him. He gave them a promise that a son would be born who would bridge the gap between God and sinners. And um, so from Genesis to Malachi, the entire Old Testament pointed to one, the anticipation of one who would come, who the prophet Haggai called the desire of the nations. And um, so... For approximately 4,000 years, they anticipated his arrival. And, when, and we find the explanation for all of this in the New Testament from 1 Corinthians. If you want to read 1 Corinthians 15, um, 45 and 49, I'm just going to reference Romans 3, 9 through 23, which says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none who, who are good, none who are righteous, none who seek God, that God had a plan um, through the Son of Man, sending His Son, who was, whose title was the Son of Man, um, who would be the second Adam, who would make everything right. You want to read that? Okay. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven, and was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Okay, and this is, this is very relevant and personal to us right now, Amy, because... In the last few months, I buried my mother-in-law, and uh, I lost my dad a couple of years ago. And you just you're just about to, in a couple of days, have a, a service for your grandmother, who is now in the presence of the Lord. So everyone who's born of Adam, that's our first birth, we're born spiritually dead, and that's going to require a, a a a birth, a new birth. Jesus said in John 12, but. Again, the entire Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi was pointing us to the solution to all of our problems. That we were all born in sin. We were all born spiritually dead without the Spirit. We were all born separated from God. If we remain in that condition, we will die and we will eternally be separated from God. And that is not His wish and His desire. So that's why we have the Gospel. And it's good. Gospel means good news. So the, it, the next letter in our acronym is uh, M for manifestation. So how patient and long-suffering God must have been. Um, after 4,000 years of God speaking about this one 
and 400 years of silence in between Genesis, um, excuse me, Malachi and Matthew, um, God manifest, his spoken word was manifest in the person of a, his son. A virgin gave birth to a baby boy in a stable in Bethlehem, just as it was written. That was written in Isaiah 7, 14, that a virgin would give birth to a son, and he would be called um, Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, it was written that he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And um, that the Son would be given. It, the promise was made, actually, to the devil in the garden. God made a promise that one would come, that he would be born uh, of a woman. A son would be born of a woman, and her seed was going to crush Satan's head, going to destroy what took place in the garden. And then here he came. In Micah 5, 2 through 9, 2 through 5, it says that this one would be a shepherd of his people, and this one that was anticipated would be born in Bethlehem, and so it was. So all all the things that were written about him were fulfilled. Um, many, like 200 prophecies were fulfilled at his first coming. But anyway, he lived a perfect, sinless life, for 33 years, and then he was, and then they killed him. He was crucified. But this was all written in Psalms 22. It was written in detail in Isaiah 53. But on the third day, he rose again to life, just as it was written. And so you can read this part of God's big story in the New Testament Gospels, which are written by Matthew, Mark, um, Luke and John, and two of those, Matthew and John, were Jesus' inner circle, his 12 disciples. The other two were disciples of the disciples. So in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And, um, and then many other scriptures. We have Luke 1, 1 through 5. We have Luke 23, 1 through 56, and Luke 24, and it just goes on and on. So the manifestation of his coming was recorded for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The next um, letters in our acronym are P, and, and I've added another one, multiplication. So proclamation and multiplication. So, reversing the curse of Babel, the Lord Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to his disciples so that they could proclaim the good news to the nations. And so they did. All Jesus' followers went everywhere proclaiming to everyone that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, had come. He lived among us for 33 years. Then he died and rose on the third day, just as it was written. And everyone who repented of their sins and trusted in him could live forever. You can read about this in Luke's discipling letter to Theopolis, which is the book of Acts. So, um, just again, the entire book of Acts is the recorded history of them going everywhere, obeying the Great Commission, and telling everyone. You see, disciple making is about building people who will go and spread God's name and fame to the nations. In other words, they will multiply the gospel. The, in, the linchpin in God's plan to bless all nations is through obedience, his people obeying the Great Commission. So that's proclamation and multiplication in the book of Acts. The next letter is E for explanation. The signs that pointed to Jesus were everywhere in the Old Testament, the only book that, is, that they had in the day. Yet God's plan was so intricate, so mysterious, so mind-boggling, that grasping it all required a lot of explanation. That's what we have the epistles from Romans to Jude. That's what they're all about. From Romans to Jude is um, the explanation of this mysterious gospel. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 16, we have an explanation of God's glorious plan to have one multi-ethnic ethnic family. Let's do read that. Let's read Ephesians. I want you to read Ephesians um, 1... I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read 2, start Amy in verse 11, and go to the end of Ephesians 2, because this, again, we need to see that from the very beginning, from the Genesis, God had a plan, and this plan included people from every nation 
under Earth. Here's our map over here, and, and we are, every little dot, if you can see it in the picture, is represents a people group that we're reaching right now. Go ahead, Amy. Okay. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, such as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So this is very fitting for the time that we're living in. Um, before we even get to our last acronym is the, con the consummation of everything, the big story, is that we are living in a time of division of every kind, racial division, um, enmity. In one of our lessons, The Well Who Came to the Woman, we're going to talk about this some more today when we record this lesson. But this is a big deal because only the, this gospel message can unify and bring peace. Um, in, in Micah, when it said that he would be born, this one who was anticipated would be born in Bethlehem, he would be a shepherd and he would be our peace. Paul explains to us that, in fact, that's who Jesus is and what he did when he died on the cross and rose on the third day, that he made peace. He made peace between all ethnic groups. And again, his family is made up of every tribe and nation and language and tongue. When he says he loved the whole world, he was talking about ethnicity, not geography. Not necessarily geography, like Amy has been to um, China and Nepal and um, we make disciples in, in South and Central America in, um, in Africa. That's not, he's talking about ethnic groups of people. So God's big story is for everybody. It's not just for one tribe or, or nation and language. Um, right here is a copy of our, of our book in Hindi. So we've just finished this book in the Hindi language and it's being translated into Nepali and Tamil right now and also French. And here is our copy of um, the book, The Strand of Pearls, basically the same book um, in Spanish. So it's for all people groups. Now the consummation of all things, this is our last letter C, will not take place until... Every person, every tribe and nation and language and tongue on the face of the earth hears this good news, receives this gospel. And that's what we're all about. This is, this is the foundation that we begin our building process of making disciples on is the gospel message. So um, God saved the best for last. The greatest story ever told ends with a wedding. Jesus showed John, his beloved disciple, how the story would end. He wrote it all out in the book of Revelation, or Apocalypse in Spanish. The Lord Jesus, and also Greek. The Lord Jesus will have all his children with him in paradise one day. For now, he's preparing a home in heaven for them where, where there will be no death or crying or pain um, there. And when his name and his fame reaches the ends of the earth, God and his people will live happily ever after. Will you be part of making that happen? And you can read about this in Revelation. You want to go ahead and read Revelation 5 and 9 through 13 for us, Amy. Um, so the proclamation of the gospel was recorded. There he is. 
Our battery's running out. Okay. We're in the age of proclamation of the gospel, explaining God's big story, and multiplication as we are going through our lives making disciples of all nations. Our stat strategy to accomplish this is woven throughout this book. So, um, you want to read Revelation? This is the end of the story. Okay. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. So that's that's the conclusion of, of God's big story. And so we're going to begin with our first gospel lesson now in Amy Rhodes who has lived in, well, I'll tell, let you tell the countries you've lived in and then get right into it. But, but this is one of my favorite gospel lessons, is the gospel of the three crosses. So Amy's going to teach that to us now.